One day, you're just sitting with your wife, watching TV. Then all of a sudden, the world changes. How it all happened so fast. No warning, no breaking news, just the sounds of explosions outside, and the screaming that would be drowned out with laughter. A week of watching the carnage and bloodshed being spilled in the streets, until there was nothing more but a silent emptiness, a few screams for help from a distance, an opportunity for Ian and Penny to leave the attic of their apartment, an attempt to leave Glasgow. The plan was to move out at night and follow the main road out of the city, but with every cackle and howl halting their movement, precious night time being wasted as Ian and Penny hid from the horrors that destroyed the streets. Nothing but absolute horror when seeing the city's orange glow. The city that was on fire. And seeing a group of people from a distance coming towards them. Not sure if they were people or one of them. Ian and Penny weren't obviously willing to find out. Nobody knows how it happened. Where it all began. It was like seeing this world for the first time. It was like we lost control, that no matter how hard we tried digging our claws in, there was no control for what came, and that's how the world turned red so fast. And that's how Ian lost Penny. Nearly free from the city, Ian and Penny only needed to find a way to get across the freeway. They knew the risks, the dangers, speeding traffic and the killing, but freedom was only six lanes away. Ian was convinced they could make it. If they can take an advantage of the chaos, no one would notice them. But the dangers was unpredictable. Penny had almost lost her life to a fleeing vehicle. But that moment was when she was noticed. One of them used an infant to infect Penny. After everything Ian saw happening in the streets when it all began, he did not expect they would use an infant to infect others, but was already numb to the traumatic horror. And yet, Ian experienced intense fear when knowing that this was it for Penny. The last thing Penny said was that she loved Ian before telling him to run and taking her own life. When looking back, putting hopes in the child was very foolish. Hopes in the idea of a child. Rebirth, regeneration, the world made new, the future. After everything, no wonder why they went with the idea. Realistically, Ian was starting to see that this was both a foolish and fatal idea. Who is that comedian? You know, the one that said, your children aren't special? Anya's boyfriend died a while back. Now all she has is her brother Mark. Every day Ian would see the fatal notion working its magic on the rest of the group. You may not see it right now, but Ian knew that there was a growing frustration. When they found her, nobody knew she was carrying a child until she began showing the signs. And now here they are, clinging on this idea of a future to ease the reality of the situation. Ian didn't want to say it. But Anya was just an illusion with disastrous results. Even though the frustration lingers and fades, every now and then it keeps coming back. During the summers, they would be in the highlands, up in the glens where it was cool. They'd come down to scavenge when the snow fell, 
Already the towns and cities nearby were isolated, nothing but ghost towns. For entertainment, there was Rob and Alec, a pair who were like a radio. John used to work on the rigs. Most of the time he kept to himself. Nobody knows his story, family, friends. Probably best that way. But the kind of guy you would want in the group. Harry was the interesting one. Claims to be Prince Harry. THE Prince Harry. Even though many were convinced of this, you really couldn't tell with his face being like that. Not that it mattered. Claims that when the guards grabbed him and his father to fly them to Baltimore, where there was a hidden bunker for the royal family, not only did they find the bunker being swarmed, but was attacked when the helicopter landed. The last thing Harry saw was Granny chewing off Charlie's buttocks. They found him somewhere near that area. Not sure if Harry's story has any merit or not. Not like anyone cares. Harry was definitely a good fighter. And of course, he did have that rifle. Aside from finding Harry, during their scavenging trips, they did find firearms, food, and supplies from farms and dead soldiers, and a few grenades, but no pistols. Ricky was a real godsend to the group, a paramedic. And there was Pat, the useless prick. If Ian were to be honest here, it's maybe because of Pat why nobody is putting too much focus on Enya and her brother. And there was Ian. Would you like to know a secret? Something that Ian has kept hidden from the group? When they found the grenades from the dead soldiers, they found two grenades. Except nobody knows that Ian found a third grenade. Ian decided to keep that one for himself. You know, for when the time came. It's been a while since Ian saw the cross. Expected to see a few here and there. But nobody anticipated that there would come a day when there was over 40 wandering in these mountains. Maybe more. Two groups, or one, strung out. No reason why they would travel this far south. Unless the cross have no direction. Not surprising how they need no reason. Just wandering south, looking for the next city, perhaps. Maybe if the group keep low, they'll pass on. There was the idea of Harry sniping them with that rifle of his, but with a magazine and a half. The moment when Harry opens fire when they reach effective range, he'll drop 15 for sure, 20 max, before they're on them, assuming that every shot is a kill. So yeah, fuck no to that idea. Remember what was said about them thoughts over Pat, the useless prick of the group? There was reasons for that, especially when he failed to keep watch on the west side of the mountains, failing to let others know that there were a few more in the distance. If it wasn't for Alec, they would never have seen the big one flanked by two heading towards them. The two smaller ones were not much of a threat, but the big one, the leader, she was going to be a challenge. Immediately the group ran to the ridge nearby, thankfully they were quick enough before being spotted, but just a matter of time before they were found. Fucking Pat, one of these days he's going to end up making a mistake that's going to get everyone killed. So what do you do in a situation like this? Any minute now, they'll be right on them. Using the rifles will draw on the rest. But what choice do they have? The moment when these three are shot down, it'll be a miracle if they survive from the others. And just as Harry, John, and Ian was about to fire, that was when Alec had an idea. For a second, Everyone thought he lost his mind when grabbing a stone and throwing it at the biggest one. Nobody had known what the fuck he was doing. But instead of the big one coming towards them in a murderous frenzy, she ended up attacking one of the others, assuming that she was attacked by one of her followers. Clever bastard. And Alec grabbing another stone, throwing it at the big one again, causing her to kill the other follower, splitting his head in half with that axe. Now the odds were starting to change, but comes the tricky part, which is taking out the leader without drawing in the rest. Thank God there was a plan for that. The plan was simple, but very risky. Alec didn't hesitate when acting as bait with a little flirtation. Immediately the giant woman chased Alec to the ridge, and as expected, failing to see the others, nor realizing that this was a trap. 
Just as Alex stepped up the ridge and into the stream, a split second before the leader swung the axe for his head, that was when she ended up falling into the stream, the perfect opportunity to take her out by dropping a giant log onto her. Even though the giant woman was pinned, she still wasn't dead. That screaming, that yelping, could attract the others. And Ian jumping into the stream, running right towards her and keeping her face pinned down with his foot. Ian knew that this was the stupidest thing he ever did. But watching this bitch drown, feeling her teeth caving into his boot. Yeah, very reckless. But God did it feel so good. It just felt so good watching her drown. Nobody didn't say much after that. Everyone knew that Alec was the hero of the day, and once again, Pat was a useless prick. There was no real celebration. Once again, everyone kept to themselves, knowing that this was just a tiny victory in a losing battle. Just a little kick to keep on going, until the day came when they start facing the facts. The cross is going to kill everyone, and they're going to kill themselves. Everyone is going to die. The only plan that Ian and everyone else has is just keep moving forward until they die. Wake up every day with no reason to go on and just keep moving. Clinging onto some notion that... Well, just clinging. This is no fucking Walking Dead. There is no hope. Everyone is going to die. But for today, it is nice to have an illusion or two. Three days after Penny's death, that was where Ian found himself falling into this group of survivors. Just wondering, looking for someone to tell him to do something. Only to find out that he was just looking for a break. Ian just needed a breather. A moment to recollect himself before facing the reality of his situation. It's a new world. Things are different now. Safety in numbers may seem like a sensible thing at a time like this. But surveying the scene of this group, Ian could easily tell that this was not survival. Just the idea of survival. A group that wouldn't last long in a world like this. The biggest sign of danger was the three men arguing over their options of what to do. One saying that they should go south where there are more people. The constable saying everyone should stay and wait for the authorities. The moment when somebody steps up and says something, the notch went up in noise greater chances of drawing more attention. Even after Ian suggested that they should keep moving and avoid bringing more attention to themselves, even though everyone agreed, the three still went on. As I said, what you are now seeing is the idea of survival. It didn't take long before Ian started to experience a growing fear with this group. He could see it more clearly when looking at the other people. Like a predictable story, an elderly couple who will surely slow down the group. The mother and her two children were also not going the last, knowing some idiot will die playing hero when trying to save them, and everyone just sitting around doing nothing as these three continue going on like teenagers. This is not a group. Ian can easily tell that all these people were just waiting to be herded out by someone who simply cannot go forward. Over half of them will not live more than two days. With what's happening in the world, these numbers will be a problem, and those three trying to lead will surely bring trouble on their heads. They never notice Ian leaving, except the mother. Maybe it was a shred of humanity. Ian tried warning her to leave the group with the boys. Even though she understood the dangers, the risks in staying, she still remained. For all he knows, they may have made it, probably doing better than him right now but there was a deep sadness to this. A regret that came with an understanding to it. What you just witnessed was something that can get people killed and the world turn red. And what makes this predictable story easier to understand. Everyone is going to die 
Ian knew that if you wanted to survive, you have to keep moving forward. You're going to have to leave being like the people in the past and realize that you are now in a world that has no hope. After the world turned, after everything Ian witnessed, there are still some moments that gives a crippling dread to this group, especially when lingering thoughts start becoming a reality. When the world changed, humanity has been on the run, hiding in the darkest corners, clinging on to whatever hope or prayer to avoid the inevitable. You have to understand, hope is a foolish dream, and right now, he and the others are about to show you why hope is nothing more but a fatal horror. There is no hope. Only a group of people who are now realizing that it's only about staying alive and what they're willing to do to keep it that way. Since they found an army of cross traveling south through these mountains, nobody was prepared for this. Everyone assumed that they wouldn't venture through these parts due to the extreme temperatures. Ian thought it would be suicide for the cross to wander through these mountains. <laughs> suicide. After everything Ian saw, the things these cross do, how could he have been so fucking stupid to assume that the cross would not travel through these parts? Now with the cross on their trail, not sure if they're being hunted or not, moving forward was now essential. Nobody didn't want to say it, but they knew it was just a matter of time before the cross catches up to them should explain why everyone agreed, some reluctantly, that Pat would finally be useful by putting enough time and space between themselves and the cross. Ian couldn't deny the shameful feeling when seeing how everyone quickly agreed to leave Pat behind when he found him stealing a biscuit. Left with no supplies, no food, nothing to keep him warm from the freezing temperatures. Nobody will admit it, but being on the run, they were just waiting for Pat to fuck up again an excuse in hopes of having something to tell themselves that there's still a shred of humanity within them. And with John and Ian holding down Pat as Ricky sliced the tendons on Pat's heels, now the only hope that Ian has is if Pat will be enough to keep the cross busy. Just enough time to push through this when hearing Pat scream and swearing that he'll find them after turning as they walked off, Ian could see the dread growing within Anya. Kinda makes you wonder, what would have happened if Pat did not fuck up? If there truly is a difference between these people and the cross, Ian will not admit it. But in a world about survival, there is a reason why Anya is afraid. If you understand the human animal, what man is willing to do to survive, then this story should be very predictable to you. And why it's not just the cross that Anya should be fearing especially after what happened with Pat. It's not sure if Pat was enough to keep the cross busy or not. The following days was not easier. With the cross being 20 miles away and still closing in, according to Harry, it was Anya that was making Ian feel more uneasy. Even though the group tried pushing forward and maintaining enough speed to outpace them, Ian couldn't help but strongly feel that Anya's frequent stops was going to be a problem. The sudden shock when hearing her yelp and moan the urge to take off and flee was now growing. Oh yes, this story was now becoming more clear to Ian. The weight becoming more unbearable. Question is, how is Ian going to tell everyone about this story? 
and how it's going to end. Every now and then, Ian would look around at the others and wonder, who else is feeling the pressure? When they wandered into a killing field, remnants of skeletons, closer examination you could see men and women who went crossed. Lord knows what they were doing here before they all died. Things kind of started to make sense of the scenery when they found a crashed plane nearby. Of course, it wasn't the cross that was steering the plane. If that was the case, you would be seeing a crater instead of signs of someone trying to land it. Regardless of what happened, whatever happened here, was something that happened a long time ago. And so far, it's the best place to rest, according to Ricky. Seeing how Anya was ready to have a child any moment now, according to him, there really isn't much of a choice. Ian knowing that they can't afford resting here, that waiting here will only bring the cross closer to them. He just couldn't shake away the sick feeling of what Ricky said. There really isn't much of a choice. Knowing what's happening, what's coming, how can he agree with that? There are other options. Question is, who else agrees to this? It didn't take long before Ian came forward and informed the others about their situation. Seeing how he was the one who was making the decisions and leading. He had to say it. He had to be the one who said that there are other options. Lord knows he didn't want to. But fuck. Can't keep going forward with conspiracy shit or sneaking around. It's something that needed to be said. The cross is 20 miles away from them. Probably less than that. And they are closing in. If they keep stopping like this and not moving forward... It's just a matter of time before they catch up. Even with Harry's rifle, the grenades, and the weapons they have, it won't be enough against those numbers. There is absolutely no way they can go up against what's coming their way. Which is why Ian heavily suggests that they leave Anya and Mark behind. If possible, they'll set a rendezvous point for them to meet up. But there is no way they can survive if they choose to stay here. If they come, everyone is going to die. Yes, it's not something Ian wanted to think of, but regardless of Mark and Ricky's disgust with Ian's idea of abandoning a pregnant woman, that he would even think of such a thing, you have to look at the situation they're in. First off, nobody knew Anya was pregnant until she began showing the signs. It's not like anyone agreed to this. And not only that, nobody knows how long it will be before Anya has the child or how long it will take before she fully recovers. If they stay here, with the cross coming their way, the only thing they have to keep them alive is a miracle, and obviously you can see that the world is empty of those. Even though Ricky's swearing that Anya is due for the child at this moment, it's still not enough to deny the fact that they're putting themselves in a dangerous situation over this. The fact is, there are people in this group who are telling themselves stories of salvation and a fucking kid, thinking that they're hard men whose hearts will melt when having a chance to protect the innocent. That is something else, something from a film or a book. In case they haven't seen enough of this world, it's something that they don't get to have. All they get is the fucking cross. What that means is that any minute now, someone is going to say the word hope. And that's when they're truly fucked. Which is why Ian decided to put it to a vote as to who wants to stay or who wants to leave. Even though Ian vowed that if the vote was against him, he would not try and leave. He would stay and be there for each and every person, like what they've been doing all along. But Mark was right. After Ian's little stunt, being the one suggesting to put his sister's life to a vote, there is no going back to normal. The only ones who voted to leave was Ian, Harry, and John. Ian lost. And as promised, Ian and everyone else stayed. That night, Anya went into labor. Ricky reckoned that he could perform the delivery. How the fuck can you bring a child into a world like this? For obvious reasons, things were different that night. Everyone kept to themselves, except Harry, 
All night, Harry tried working on Ian and John, but they were not having it. Ian stood by his word of staying, but also knew that what he did earlier had already divided the group. Every fiber within him wanting to run off and save himself, even though he may have damaged the group, doomed everyone, Ian just could not bring himself into running off again. Stupid. Ian felt so fucking stupid. The following morning, everyone was anxiously waiting for the child. They were now on borrowed time, that unbearable feeling of clinging onto a miracle. Death was coming. It wasn't until John decided to check up on the situation, he too feeling the pressure. It was John who would be the one announcing that Anya and her child had died. Before they left, nobody said anything when Mark wanted to give his sister a burial. Everyone waited and kept moving on with nothing but the feelings, the feelings of hope. That was the moment when Ian knew that they were fucked. I bet we're all wondering, where did it all begin? How did it all start? Oh, the who, what, when, where, and why. A minute. We had it coming. According to Harry, he claims it was a virus outbreak that began in North Yorkshire after a man viciously murdered his family. Following the event, two policemen that apprehended the man began acting strange violently attacking people before the whole population ended up mysteriously disappearing. It wasn't until later before they found every man, woman, and child of North Yorkshire walking off of a cliff in what looked like a mass suicide. That was before the infected started to show the red rashes and turn on the remaining population. But there's no way that's correct. How it all started there. Seeing how the whole world was infected in a matter of a few days. Some believe it was a few hours. Either way, nobody stood a chance. But if you really want to cut the bullshit, I think this all started long before the outbreak. Confess. Some of you enjoy this horror show. Some of you have an inner shame in feeling that small sense of joy when seeing other people suffer, and how you despise others who are not afraid to be more open with them inner thoughts. Is that why we are too afraid to look deep into our human origins? How we silly humans keep making the same stupid mistakes when not learning from our past? Are people too afraid to see the similarities between ourselves and the cross? That the only difference is that they're not holding back what we've been wanting to do for so long? Is it not true that we humans have an ancient appetite for bloodshed and murder? How we humans have used our creative ways to explore new methods of torture, that there was a time when man enjoyed exploring the pain and suffering being inflicted upon others. How we humans had once raped and destroyed each other for the sheer joy of it, to achieve that grand sense of sadistic happiness. Oh yeah, life was hell. And it still is. But somewhere down the road, we started to pretend that hell was nothing more but a silly fable in the afterlife, and how we created God and Satan to take credit for our sadistic ways, how we are now a human race that go about our miserable lives trying to convince ourselves that we are not in hell, and yearning for a taste of sadism and pain. You know, my friends, there are two types of people in this world, and two types of people watching this horror show. Those who enjoy what they see, and those who are repulsed by their inner feelings when watching the horror show. Yes, you may stand before the world against this filth and violent garbage, trying to explain the concept of good and evil, until one day, God gets tired of your bullshit, and you end up with a red rash on your face, where good and evil no longer exist, only the experience of absolute freedom. And why wouldn't God do that? 
Is it not true that he had once taken credit for the pain and suffering upon others? That God may have enjoyed the taste of bloodshed we given on behalf of his name, and is now upset that we have changed our ways? And we humans, self-proclaimed crusaders that only dream of those sadistic horrors when damning others. <laughs> A heaven where humans dream of other humans being tortured and damned. Sorry, friends. God is laughing. Satan is crying. I guess we'll never know if it's true, if Harry was actually the Prince Harry or not. They came out of nowhere when they grabbed him. Sure, he may have taken down a few with that rifle of his. But they got him. And as you can see, they got Harry pretty good. Shouldn't surprise you that Harry died. As I said, this is no fucking Walking Dead. In this world, everyone dies. Now at the cross three miles behind. I guess Ian and the others can afford a little good news when seeing how the numbers are down to a two dozen. You can see how the temperature is taking a toll on the cross, most of them staggering and burning out. Even though Harry had given some time, it still doesn't mean that their situation has improved. Realistically, the cross will catch up to them. According to Ian, with their numbers staggering and half of them already weakened and dying off, if they can just find a way to grab Harry's rifle, and with the munitions they already have, take out the fast ones first, there's a good chance they'll survive through this. The plan is simple. Wait until the cross sees them, and the moment they start running towards them, that's when they can divide the cross by splitting into two groups, each group running in an arc as they make their way back to Harry. Hopefully, by doing this, they can tire them out, if they're lucky. By the way, whoever reaches Harry's rifle first can start dropping out the fast ones, and that's where they can take care of the rest. Even though Harry did say that fighting against the cross was a bad idea, that was when there was more of them in better condition. They are now weak, and there is a strong chance to take them out right now instead of having to take the risks and outrunning them. With Mark and the group still shaken by Ian's democracy stunt of leaving Anya behind, and the idea of fighting them being too risky. So far, Ian's idea was the only plan they have. Either that, or they can just keep moving forward until the end, hope by some miracle that they don't get the drop on them like they did with Harry. And I think we already know how miracles work in a world like this. Being the one making difficult choices as a leader, I think Ian began feeling the full gravity of his situation when John decided to take Rob and Alec with him. Knowing that those two are the slowest ones in the group, armed with nothing but a shotgun and two grenades. If Ian could, he would have given John the third hand grenade. But he didn't. He just couldn't bring himself into giving John that third grenade. I think John may have seen enough bullshit in his days, enough to figure Ian out. That we may know what will happen if Rob and Alec went with Ian. Kinda makes you wonder if things could have been different for Pat, Anya, Harry especially after Ian sharing his thoughts of Alec and Rob not surviving through this with John, where one begins to think, if it's their fearless leader who's the true danger of the group, that in a world turned red is an excuse for everyone else being expendable. Survival of the fittest. Even though it seemed like the plan worked when the cross divided into two groups, unfortunately they left too late. The cross were catching up, four of them sprinting, leaving Ian and Ricky no choice but to take out the fast ones as Mark kept on running. 
Two double-barreled shotguns, buckshot, each shot must count, which is why they must pick their shots when they're close enough. Ian, now frozen with terror, he didn't plan for this, a scenario of having to stand his ground against the cross. Now with Ricky being the one leading, first two shots were a success in dropping down the first two cross. Good. Now comes the second barrel, not until the other two are close enough, but fear had gotten the better of Ian, causing a premature shot that only grazed the shoulder. Thankfully, Ricky's second shot had only taken down the third one, but managed to knock down the other one that Ian was supposed to kill, giving Ian enough time to reload his shotgun and take down the fourth one, while Ian just stood there, terrified and exposed. Moments away from death, it took Ian a moment to recollect himself. Mark was already gone, but before taking off, that was when Ricky and Ian would notice a familiar face running towards them. It couldn't be. But it was. Fucking Pat. How in God's name did he not change? He should not be running. And the moment when Ricky learned the grisly answer to that question, that was when the ground beneath Ricky gave way, causing him to fall to the bottom of the cliff trapped and forced to fend off the cross, realizing that Ricky wasn't going to make it. Immediately Ian ran off with the sounds of shots coming from Ricky, also the sounds of two explosions from the distance. John must have ran into trouble much sooner than they expected. Hopefully Ricky was smart enough to do himself in. Already the plan is turning to shit. Doubtful if John, Alec, and Rob are still alive. Just Ian and Mark. But I guess that means nothing to Ian, doesn't it? Mark, just another gun to save his own ass. By now, I think we're seeing Ian revealing his true colors with these difficult choices. A gutless coward who's willing to do whatever it takes to save his own ass with this bullshit facade. A man who latches onto any group that can keep him alive without having to worry about anyone else slowing him down. Just a selfish asshole who thinks that this fucked up world is an excuse for his cowardly ways. Finally reaching Harry's body, Harry's rifle must be about 20 yards away from him. But where? Much like John, Mark had already seen through Ian's bullshit since his democracy stunt. It's clear now that this selfish fucker is out to save himself. No different than the cross that are coming straight towards them. Even if they survive through this, there's no way Mark will be moving forward with Ian, trying to get a count of how many cross are left. That was when Mark noticed something. One of the cross was carrying something on his back. It... It was Anya. They dug up Anya's body. Why did they dig her up? Nothing but grief and rage within Mark when seeing Anya's corpse being carried. The sick bastards had to go and dig her up. And Mark having no care for Ian's pleas nor his plans for Harry's rifle, nothing but intense rage to take on the cross, and Ian. Ian. All this is because of him. They wouldn't be in this mess if it wasn't for him. It was all him who wanted to leave Pat with those sick fucks. Him who wanted to leave Anya, and now he probably wanted to leave Alec and Rob. And Ricky would still be alive if Ian wasn't such a fucking coward. It's clear that the only thing Ian wants is that goddamn rifle. Mark nearly killing Ian with the shotgun. Ian lost. He did not kill Anya. He agreed to stay. But I think we all know that's bullshit. Whether he killed Anya or not, doesn't matter. Ian is full of shit. And he's dangerous. And Ian left with no choice but to leave Mark behind. With one more shot in Mark's double barrel, not enough time to reload before being grabbed. Just Ian left with the hopes that Mark was smart enough to use that final shot on himself. They're coming to get you, Ian. Everyone is now gone. Just Ian, panicking and all alone. And frantically looking around Harry's corpse for that rifle he's been wanting. It didn't take that long before Ian found it. And now is the time where Ian stands his ground. Just remember what Harry said. Hold it right, aim properly, control your breathing, don't jerk the trigger. The bullets are small, they're designed to kill with shock, but you still need to let your target to come in close and make sure you're aiming for the head or the center chest. 
Ian is a coward. But somewhere in there is a killer. Make sure you keep the selector on single shot. If you're close enough for full auto, then that's when you're fucked. And count. You must make sure you count each shot. The last thing you want to hear is a dead man's click. The terror within Ian when realizing he'd forgotten how many rounds Harry shot before they got him. Stupid, Ian. So fucking stupid. Remembering Harry mentioning that he had another magazine. Does that mean 15 shots? 20? 10? Not enough time to look for it. The crossed are coming. And Ian can't afford having them getting close. The only thing Ian has is hope. Hope that every shot counts. And that there's enough rounds to kill these sick fucks. And one after the other, Ian began dropping off the cross. The fear washing away with the adrenaline. A sadistic joy of watching them die. Ian had surprised himself when seeing them fall. Every round being a kill shot. And the last one closing in. Too stupid to use that shotgun he's carrying. For a split second, Ian couldn't believe what was happening when blowing off the head of the final cross. It was a miracle. He made it. Until the sound of a shotgun going off and the blood splashing across Ian's face, coming from Harry's head being blown off. Harry's corpse, which was next to Ian, his infected corpse. Stupid. So fucking stupid, Ian. I guess it is true that the moment when somebody starts thinking of the word hope, then that's when they're truly fucked. Oh, the burning poison surging through Ian, the immense pain throbbing behind his eyes, working its way to his brain. And now comes the third grenade, Ian getting to see Penny once again. Would you like to know something about Ian? Oh yes, he loved Penny. He idolized her. And how she hated him with cold black passion. The day when she found out that he betrayed her. Ian. Our selfish asshole, the coward, who can't bring himself to pull that pin. But why would he want to do such a thing? We've already seen through Ian's bullshit. We've seen him for what he truly is. In a world where there is no need for bullshit, no need to hide from what we truly are. Ian is a killer. Did you not witness the sadistic joy of him killing off the cross? Wonder what he must have felt when watching his boot going into the face of that infected woman? In case you've forgotten, I'll remind you. We are in hell. And in hell, Ian is no different. In a world that no longer judges you. And Ian feeling the hand on his shoulder. I guess I was wrong about everyone dying. Behind Ian, their leader, was Pat, that useless prick. Mark and Anya. Rob and Alec, Ricky, John, and of course Harry's rifle. The whole gang's here. <laughs> I don't think anyone gave a shit about Harry. Who gives a fuck if he's Prince Harry or not? At least Ian has that cool rifle. It's okay, Ian. Nobody will judge you. There's no need to pretend in the world that's turned red. <laughs>